Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Speaking of Resilience podcast. I'm your host, Kate Madigan, with the Michigan Climate Action Network. This podcast is also brought to you by the Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities, and we talk about climate solutions in Michigan and the Midwest. Today's guest is Dr. Lisa Del Bono. Dr. Del Bono is a physician who practiced as a surgical pathologist at Munson Medical Center in Traverse City for more than 20 years. She is now the founder of the Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action, or MICA, which is working to address and raise awareness of climate change's adverse health effects. In this episode, we talk about the health impacts of climate change globally and here in Michigan, and the disproportionate health impacts on frontline communities. We also talk about how we can reduce health impacts both at the community level and with policy change to rapidly address the climate crisis. Here's our interview. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lisa Del Bono. Thanks so much, Kate. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. So to start us off, will you tell us about your background and how you ended up working on climate change and founding the Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action? Absolutely, Kate. Thanks for the question. You know, my family moved many times as I grew up, but we eventually settled in Kentucky where I got my undergraduate and medical degrees. I did my postgraduate training in diagnostic pathology at University of Michigan, and I stayed there as an assistant professor for a short ten tenure and eventually moved north to practice in Tra Traverse City for most of my career. Until 2012, like many people in my profession, it took all of my energy to do a good job for my patients and spend time with my husband and son and get out for an occasional bike ride or hike. Climate change seemed like a far off concern, but the extreme weather events of that year, you know, woke me up to the fact that the climate crisis uh, was affecting many people today and most likely would have a pretty profound effect on my son's future. So in 2013, I started volunteering with a grassroots advocacy organization called Citizens Climate Lobby or CCL. And that's where I really found my passion. Um, I co-led CCL's health action team. And through this work, I became aware of another really amazing organization called the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. And what that is, is a coalition of 31 of the, 31 of the leading medical societies including the American Medical Association, all calling for urgent action on climate change. And so since the climate crisis was becoming more urgent and my passion to work in the advocacy space kept growing, I decided to retire a little bit early when the pandemic struck. And with the help of Dr. Julie Quinn, who's a retired OB-GYN doc, who also lives in Traverse City, we started the Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action, and that's a state affiliate of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Okay, great. Thank you. And what does MICA, is it, do, does the acronym MICA, the Michigan Clinicians for yep, Climate Yep, MICA Action? is how we call it. Yep. Okay, great. And what does MICA focus on? What do you do? Sure. So our mission is to educate clinical colleagues the public and policymakers about how climate solutions are actually health solutions. You know, being on the front line of patient care provides us with a rich opportunity to see, to see some of the most extreme situations in life. And we're trained to connect the dots between how a patient presents in clinic and the root cause of disease. I think those well-honed skills provide critical insights, which we can then use to educate our patients, the general public and policymakers. I think it's our responsibility to share our insights, to encourage legislators, to create policies that place human health in the very center of all of our decision-making. And I think that the true stories that we have accrued in our clinical practice are like our superpower, if you will, when talking to policymakers. That was brought home to me a couple months ago when a group of MICA volunteers met with several congressional offices. We had a young medical student with us who explained how a patient came into the ER just gasping for breath on a warm day in inner city Detroit where air pollution was high and she was fearful for her life. 
And as they worked really hard to place a breathing tube and stabilize her condition, he reflected on the fact that she might not have been that ill if it were not for the combination of air pollution, which is caused by burning fossil fuels largely, and the unusual warm temperatures. And it was in striking how congressional staffers, regardless of party affili affiliation, uh, reacted to the story he told. You know, by connecting the dots between one's personal health and our changing climate, it brings the crisis home in ways that are personal and resonate across party lines. Health professionals, especially nurses, are among the most trusted messengers. And the good news is that climate solutions are health solutions because much of what we do to address climate change is also good for our health. Yeah, and I think a couple of things. One, I think this is, Micah is so powerful because you know, Gallup polls find that physicians and other health professionals are among the most pr trusted professions in the country. So Absolutely. Such powerful messengers with lawmakers and with the public. And also, you know, Climate change, you know, has been about, you know, CO2 numbers and polar bears and, um, but talking about how it's impacting people and our health, um, and especially unjustly, um, I think is the most powerful thing we can do right now is really focus in on how it's affecting our health. So I agree a hundred percent and I appreciate recognizing that. And, you know, some people, when you think about polar bears being, you know, the environmental face um, or the natural face of the climate crisis, really health is the human face of the mm -hmm. climate crisis. Yeah. So let's talk about the health effects of climate change a little bit more. I mean, globally, you know, as I was preparing for this, the World Health Organization calls climate change the greatest health challenge of the 21st century. So can you tell us, can you kind of break down for us what the health impacts of climate change are that we're seeing globally? Yeah, I'll try. You know, global health affects us in, in three major ways. You know, we, we're aware of these direct extreme heat events and floods and fires and other extreme weather events in which climate change is just obviously plays a major role. But indirectly, it can also shift in patterns of disease carrying mosquitoes and ticks and increased waterborne diseases due to the warmer conditions and the wetter conditions and runoff and that sort of thing. And then finally, it can leverage systems that are integral to a well-functioning society. For example, you know, undernutrition becomes more prevalent as it becomes more difficult to grow healthy foods. And those who are already food insecure are those who are impacted first. Increased stresses and sometimes even violent conflict arises when groups of people are forced to leave their homes abruptly, whether it's due to a, an extreme weather event or farmers who can no longer um, produce food from their land and are forced to migrate. And sometimes there are profound economic losses simply because it becomes too hot for laborers to function well. So that's a very, very superficial overview. Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I, when you think about health, it's really like climate change affects all of the indicators of health, you know, which are clean air. Well, we need to survive. We need clean air. We need safe drinking water. We need sufficient food and we need secure shelter. And globally, all of those are threatened by climate change. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, we can't talk about the health effects of climate change without talking about justice and um, climate change and climate impacts are incredibly unjust where vulnerable, vul vulnerable populations and communities, especially communities of color and historically disadvantaged communities are experiencing the worst impacts and are not as prepared to um, become more resilient and respond and recover from the impacts as well. So would you talk about some of the disparities that you see in the health effects from climate change and in your work? Yeah, I can. And really, you know, I, I think the health disparities um, are really uh, well demonstrated if we look at air pollution. So let's focus first on air pollution. 
Um, we know that according to the state of the air uh, report by the American Lung Association, people of color are three times more likely to be um, breathing polluted air. And asthma and other breathing conditions can be made worse because of the impacts of air pollution created by burning fossil fuels and heavy traffic. And we know that heavily polluting industries like power plants and refineries and interstate highways with heavy traffic tend to be situated uh, in communities of color, often paralleling what were historically red line communities, those communities that were identified way back in the 1930s as being, quote, less desirable. Those were the communities in which these power plants were placed and the interstates were, uh, were designed to pass through. So those populations are, are disproportionately suffering the consequences um, of air pollution, and they're also suffering the consequences of extreme heat events. Um, those communities tend to be warmer more because there's more concrete in those communities, there's more buildings, and there's less green space. So they suffer from something described as the urban heat uh, island effect in which um, areas that are more, um, they have less green, let's say, cool down less, um, less quickly. So if you were to look at like inner city Detroit versus the outlying areas, uh, there's much more green space in the outlying areas. And the temperature di difference on a given day may be as great as 20 degrees. Um, on average, uh, it's at least um, three, three to four degrees warmer in inside the city as opposed to outside the city. And at nighttime, that average is more like five degrees warmer. If you were to look at the number of days that get over um, 90 degrees in Detroit, uh, they're, they're 10 more than ever on average than the days of outlying regions. So it's really striking with both air pollution and heat impacts and really water, the ability to handle extreme flood events and the water infrastructure, all of those things tend to parallel these historically red line communities, these communities um, that are disproportionately populated by people of color. So sometimes when I think about that, and I think about my privileged lifestyle, I realize that it's really been paid for on the back of um, these communities um, collective health and individuals' personal health. And as we talk more, maybe I can get into some of the health impacts of these different uh, conditions that are disproportionately um, affecting these communities. I guess the last thing I just wanna point out that I think is really uh, important is, you know, we often describe these communities as being vulnerable and they have, um, historically been disadvantaged, there's no question, but I would say that they, they tend to demonstrate tremendous strength and tremendous resilience. And I just think we have so much to learn from how they've um, bounced back and, and survived through really, really uh, difficult conditions. Mm -hmm. And you've touched on a lot of the health effects in Michigan and we started with you know global health effects, but can you, can you talk specifically about in Michigan, what are the biggest ways that climate change is affecting our health, people's health and mental health in Michigan and how, you know, and if you want to touch on how it will affect our health in the future, if we don't do what's necessary. To so, you know, yeah, sorry about that. Um, you know, we're already seeing a just really wide array of climate impacts that range from uh, extreme rain events, rain events like flooding and the flooding that's associated, which we have seen, you know, many, many times in Detroit, we've seen it in Houghton, we've seen it in Midland, to more subtle impacts like longer allergy seasons and more virulent and uh, abundant poison ivy. We know that our Great Lakes are freezing less frequently and, and that will alter the quality of our water. You know, we, we're seeing more frequent and intense toxic algae blooms. You might rem 
especially in Lake Erie, because it tends to be shallower. You might remember back in 2014, uh, a lot of um, Michigan residents in the southeast part of the state and in Toledo, they couldn't drink or bathe in their water for three days because of toxic algae blooms. Um, Overall, the weather's less predictable and growing healthy foods is more difficult and uh, it will just get more difficult as we go further. We've seen impacts in Northern Michigan, especially in the fruit growing regions. Uh, it's affecting you know, our consistent ability to grow apples, cherries, berries, and grapes to make wine. Um, and these uncertain crop productions also make conditions more unpredictable for migrant uh, workers. And people of all socioeconomic backgrounds are beginning to suffer climate anxiety. And those with pre-existing mental conditions that require medications often find that their medicines are not fully therapeutic during warmer temperatures. And conditions that are warmer are more likely to result in violent conflict. So that's just a very quick superficial overview of some of the things that we're seeing here in Michigan. Um, and I'm happy to go into some of the other ones in more depth. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, let's talk about the increased rainfall and flooding. Um, because I think um, those are, I mean, I would say, and I'd love to hear what you think, they're probably the climate impact impacts affecting people the most right now. I mean, we saw the flooding in Southeast Michigan. There was a 500 year storm that caused massive flooding and affected thousands of people. And there had been a 500 year storm just eight years prior and the health impacts from that. I'd love to hear about, and also the mental health impacts of, of, um, going through that experience and having, um, such damage to your property and your home and having the health impacts and then knowing that it could happen again. Uh, if you could talk about that, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we know that a warmer atmosphere holds more water. And so when it does rain, it just pours. We have these really heavy precipitation events. And, you know, the immediate impacts of flooding can on very rare occasions actually lead to loss of life. You know, in Houghton on Father's Day a few years back, that was the third once in a thousand year event that hit this, the south shore of uh, Lake Superior. And there was a little boy who died in that. Um, many Michigan communities, especially less wealthy inner city communities, did not have the proper infrastructure to handle these intense downpours. Uh, it, this frequently results in storm water mixing with wastewater, and then people being exposed when they're forced to evacuate through contaminated waters, or when maybe the following day they decide to swim in a contam contaminated lake or stream or river. You know, it's not unusual to see beaches closed after a heavy precipitation event because of E. coli contamination. And in one study, 16, there was a 16% increase in emergency room visits from children suffering from GI illness after an extreme rain event, because most likely because they were playing in the flooded waters and uh, get exposed to bacteria that, that where the, the sanit the sewage has flowed into uh, the storm water. Another concern um, are households who drink well water. Um, those aren't usually very well regulated and there's an increased risk that uh, bacteria could um, secondarily infect well, uh, wells. But the long-term impacts include potential neurotoxins or carcinogens from industrial or agricultural runoff. Um, in homes where you're not able, maybe there isn't the financial resources to really clean up afterwards. People are often exposed to molds that can lead to long-term respiratory uh, problems. And um, communities with poor water infrastructure have a greater risk of compromised drinking. As you described so beautifully just, just a second ago, Kate, you know, um, I, can, I, I have had, um, two sisters who live down in Texas who have had their homes flooded on more than one occasion. And it is just, um, and they had the resources to handle it, you know, the financial resources to get people to come in and clean up for them. 
and it is devastating. And so people suffer from post-traumatic stress from that. They carry those, those traumas with them. And it's very hard to, to, to not relive that and have concerns that it's going to happen again because it does happen again and it will continue to happen again until we address uh, some of the um, infrastructure problems and we reduce emissions. Finally, floods, like many other climate events, are threat multipliers. If you think about the people who were displaced in Midland when the dams broke after all of that rain, um, that was right at the beginning of the pandemic when we were in lockdown, and yet they were forced out of their homes at that time. You know, that's an example of um, an extreme weather event being a threat multiplier, and that has to be just devastating emotionally and, and um and I just, it, I feel for these people. Yes, me too. Oh, sorry, I was just muted. Um, and you touched on, you also touched on heat already, but I'd love, I'd really like to talk more about that. You talked about heat island effect. And I know that in the US, heat is the leading weather related killer. Um, and then we just saw in the Pacific Northwest, there were 115 degree temperatures where, you know, you're, I think it's at that level, your body starts to break down. You can't really um, exist in temperatures that high. That's not what you think of, of the Pacific Northwest where there's usually milder temperatures. So um, would you say that extreme heat is the biggest health concern related to climate change in Michigan or as far as like um, causing serious health effects like death? Well, it's, it definitely can cause death. And um, it, there's no question that extreme heat is a killer and will become a greater killer as we go forward in the future, especially in uh, urban areas. It's um, a risk for um, the very old and the very young, including our young athletes athletes, but the elderly with chronic illnesses like kidney, kidney disease and diabetes, and those who work outdoors in, extremely, in extreme heat conditions are really at risk. You know, when it's hot, our blood vessels dilate in an attempt to cool us down. You know, when, our di when we get all red and flushed, our blood vessels are coming closer to the surface of the skin to cool us down. But that also means that our heart has to pump a lot more quickly. Um, I was a, recently, I had uh, described to me by a dermatologist that it can increase by up to 40%. So that in turn increases our risk of cardiovascular events and heart attacks. Um, and then when we think about the relationship of kidney disease and extreme heat, I'm reminded of a story that Dr. Sherry, Cheryl Holder told of a patient named Jorge. And she describes him as a really kind man who gifted her clinic with some of the fruits he sold in the streets in the city. But every time he worked these really long, hard, hot days in the city, his uh, kidney function would decrease in large part because he was dehydrated and there just was not enough blood to get to his kidneys. Now his kidneys would, his kidney function would get much better when he took a day off or temperatures um, would cool, but you know, he had no support system and there wasn't a lot he could do. He would say, rain or shine, cold or heat, Jorge has to work. So um, a lot of people just don't have the flexibility to expose, um, uh, to avoid the heat. And that's why we really have to think about how we can um, change our, our inner city structure um, so that uh, it, it's easier for people to cool down. And maybe I can talk about that in a minute. But the last point I would like to make in terms of health impacts is that we know that when, that when we are suffering from extreme heat, that it is also more likely that we'll see violent conflicts. You know, people are just more short-tempered. It's just harder to deal with things when things are hot. So those are some of the health impacts. Okay. Thank you. So it's not just me who gets grumpy when I, when it's really hot out. It's, it's no, me, too. Being... me too. <laughs> um, yeah. And I would love to hear more about what we can do, what our state, what our communities can do to help people during heat waves to adapt and make our communities more ready for 
for more extreme heat events? Sure. You know, I think this is where President Biden's infrastructure plan is just so important because um, if we can start greening our living spaces, particularly in these more disadvantaged uh, communities, we can substantially lessen the impact of urban heat island effects. If we can plant trees among along paved streets and develop rooftop gardens and landscapes uh, that will cool the buildings or simply provide additional par parks and recreational spots, all of these can be respites for, from heat in the, in the city. Another idea is to transform vacant light, lots into so-called park pockets for easy access. And finally, just public cooling centers can also provide invaluable relief during extreme heat events. Although um, these, these infrastructure investments might require some upfront up fronts, upfront funds, uh, we know down the road it will save healthcare dollars and uh, and large numbers of lives. Let's talk about respiratory diseases too and how climate change, change is affecting respiratory diseases like asthma. Would you talk about that? Sure, absolutely. You know, and I think this is one of the, just as heat and water, um, you know, is disproportionately affecting communities of color. Um, air, the key to these respiratory diseases is air pollution. So again, according to the American Lung Association's most recent state of the air, uh, report nearly four in 10 people live in U.S. counties in which air pollution is above what's considered stay, safe. And as I stated earlier, people of color are three times more likely to live in those communities where air is polluted. Asthma and other breathing conditions can be made worse because of the air, impacts of air pollution created by burning fossil fuels and heavy traffic. And we know that heavy polluting industries, power plants and refineries and interstate highways with heavy traffic tend to be situated in communities of color, often, often paralleling these historically redlined communities. Um, what's even more concerning is the fact that as the temperature warms, the concentration of these air pollutants, especially ground level ozone, also gets greater. So we're seeing more uh, asthma attacks and breathing conditions. And even he here in Northern Michigan, our air quality index lately has been um, a little bit uh, in the high level, and that's because of the wildfires out west. And we know that the incidence of these wildfires are just going to increase with climate change. So to be clear, frontline communities experience the vast majority of the health impacts of air pollution. And as we learn more about air pollution, we see that the health impacts are much uh, greater than much involved, much more than just our respiratory tract, although the respiratory illnesses is very bad by itself. There's a correlation between the concentration of fine particulate matter, which is a type of air pollution, and many cognitive difficulties, that's thinking difficulties, memory difficulties in the elderly, as well as the incidence of preterm deliveries. And so if a baby is born it can, uh, early, it can lead to a lifetime of challenges for that child. And it's tragic for the child and her, and her family, but it also adds to the financial burdens of the society at large. And then when I think about air pollution, it would be re remiss to not mention that people of color have suffered disproportionately from COVID. And a study from Harvard found that the higher the exposure of fine particulate air pollution, small particles of air pollution, the more likely a person is to die from COVID. So it's an, just another example in which frontline com communities bear a disproportionate uh, burden. So in summary, as the temperature warms, the concentration of air pollution will warm and we can mitigate the worst impacts of climate change by transitioning to non-carbon -car forms of energy, which will not only address climate change, but it will also clean up our air and improve human health and save hundreds of billions of healthcare dollars and put people back to work. So it's kind of a no brainer. Yeah, uh, yes. And I love the way you wrap that up. And I am wanted to point out a headline or a study that just recently came out from Harvard and um, Syracuse and other researchers that found that 
getting to 80% renewable powered electricity by 2030 will save 317,000 lives and would save over a trillion dollars in health savings between now and 2050. Um, just to kind of put a, a number to just how many lives can be saved by moving uh, off of fossil fuels, just for electric, just in electricity alone. Yeah, and that's that's such a great point. You know, I'm familiar with the report, and I think the findings are are really exciting. I love the way that they've put a number and a value to um, electrifying our electricity sector. And it's good to know whether we're at 80% clean electricity by 2030 or 100 percent clean electricity by 2035. We'll see just really important life saving impacts. So. Um, a clean electricity standard is a great thing. Really, any policy that phases out coal will have similar uh, life-saving results. There have been a variety of different studies that look at that. And so I, I have to also say that a price on carbon would also phase out coal very quickly. So I really think we need to be looking at things with a yes and approach. We need a clean electricity standard, but a price on carbon is also good. Um, and in fact, some studies suggest that it would fight, phase out coal um, in, even in the electricity standard a little bit faster, but both are good. So let's embrace both. Um, one study from Columbia Center on uh, Global Energy looked very specifically on, at carbon pricing like the Energy Innovation Act, and it showed that nitrous oxide, sulfoxides, and mercury would decrease uh, by up to 95%, between 75 and 95% by uh, 2030 if, um, if we started a policy like that right away. And Many frontline communities have raised some very appropriate concerns about carbon pricing. Um, most importantly, in my opinion, the concern raised um, about secondary markets and offsets that are most frequently seen in cap and, cap and trade policies, and even some forms of a clean electricity standards is really a concern. And I'm so glad and grateful to them to point that out. You know, the devil is in the details. and. Cap and trade is very different than a carbon fee or tax. Um, those carbon fee or tax policies in place in Congress at this point do not allow for trading on a secondary market. Um, another concern raised by frontline communities is that some of the cap and trade policies used in California and in the reggae states have not have actually you know, seen emissions reductions, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but there are still pockets of air pollution in which frontline communities continue to suffer from air pollution. And that's just not fair. And had these, had frontline communities not expressed their concerns, I don't think we would have seen uh, the new uh, bill that was introduced by Senators Whitehouse and Schatz that um, is called the Save Our Future Act. And you know what's cool about that is that in that bill, it not only holds polluters accountable by placing a fee um, on fossil fuel uh, producers at its source, and that fee just keeps going up until they're they're priced out of the market, but it also puts a fee a little bit further downstream on power plants and refineries based on the amount of air pollution. Um, that has created sulfoxide, nitrous oxide, and fine particulate matter. And this fee on air pollutions should ensure that there are no hot pockets of air pollutions. Um, and so if these communities had, had not raised those concerns and Senators Whitehouse and Schatz had not spent the time really working directly with these communities and hearing their concerns, I don't think a policy like that would have been created. And I think it is just, um, it's so exciting, because, and I can discuss it in more detail, other things that it has in it, that addresses many of the frontline communities and actually takes, holds polluters accountable, takes that money and puts it back into frontline communities. Um, a horrible, as horrible as the story of air pollution is though, I wanna also focus on a silver lining. Um, and that is the fact that unlike greenhouse gases, air pollutants fall out of the atmosphere in a matter of hours or days. So there have been several natural experiments in which, you know, say a, por a, a portion of Interstate 504 in California was shut down this multi-lane highway, 
or a similar portion in inner city Atlanta was closed to traffic because of the Olympics. And there was just a dramatic and very quick improvement of air quality and a decrease in respiratory related emergency room visits in just a matter of hours. So the closer the facility was to the area that was closed to traffic, the greater the reduction in ER visits. So what that tells us is that if we were to electrify our transportation sector and transition to non-carbon forms of energy, we would see immediate health co-benefits. And these co-benefits are likely to impact those who have suffered the most from air pollution historically. So um, it really is a win-win to electrify, improve energy efficiency, have a clean electricity standard. We need all the tools in the toolbox. And I think also a price on carbon, especially when it's designed with frontline communities in mind. Um, um, thank you. And I know you've been working on a carbon fee and dividend for a long time and have a lot of expertise on that policy. And I'm glad that you, you brought up a lot of some of the concerns that have been raised um, about carbon pricing mechanisms as a way to address the climate crisis. And I think even with the changes that have been made to the policy, I understand that there are still a lot of concerns um, about carbon pricing as the solution because of, you know, within the U.S. there's evidence. I, the, the NAACP put out a report in July and, you yeah, know, there's evidence it. that carbon pricing and trading can exacerbate existing inequalities by creating or worsening sacrifice zones. So, so, you know, trades where emissions can be released or allows that sort of um, trading to happen. And I know that there has been work done to address some of those concerns. Um, but I just want to say, I don't think that there's, um, you know, there's been, there's a, you know, it's been resolved. Um, oh, I agree. It hasn't yeah. been. Involved, most yeah. definitely. And I, and I think this is, you know, it's really um, an um, incumbent on us to listen very carefully to the concerns. You know, I think, um, I think it's really important that all of us who care about this issue right now are working together. And I really think there's room for um, all of the above approach. And I'm really grateful for the concerns that have been uh, brought up, especially in terms of the trading issues. And, and, you know, that never has been a part of the carbon fee. Um, they do bring up other issues that, that um, can be interpreted as offsets, like um, if you sequester carbon and, um, some of the policies will rebate because of that. So I think if that continues to be a concern and, and I understand why it is, what I, what I would encourage is let's open the dialogue, let's talk because we're all on the same side and we all wanna see emissions come down, at least when it comes to you know, the organizations that I've worked with, which are grassroots organizations like Citizens Climate Lobby. We just want a livable world for the future. So I think it's really important that we, you know, um, hear each other and listen it as generously as possible. And when there are really valid concerns that are brought up, which have been brought up, that we learn from that. And I really would invite um, uh, more and more discussion because rather than just saying, you know, all carbon pricing is bad, I think it's important for us to really know what the concerns are. Um, you know, cap and trade is very different than a carbon fee, and um, and uh, but there there are probably ways we can make it even better. So we need to keep that dialogue open. And I would suggest that you know when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the world's experts on climate change, tells us that the most effective way to get the 50% emissions reductions that we need by the end of the decade is to put a price on carbon, then we should all come together and figure out how we can do that in a way that doesn't um, disproportionately affect frontline communities. We don't want that to happen. That's not at all our goal. And I just think um, just as many environmental justice communities have engaged in the conversation, 
um, I really encourage that to be the case and, and let's have an open dialogue and let's just make sure that we can find the best approach going forward. I, I totally agree that we are all, we all want um, a stable climate. I think, I think one other thing I just want to add to this conversation is that we have a window right now, a very um, huge opportunity with, um, you know, a very slim pro climate majority in Congress and a, um, you know, really strong support from our president right now for it to get something done. And I think there are policies being proposed that really center equity and justice and would invest, uh, make major investments in, um, in, in making sure that clean energy, uh, renewable energy and climate solution investments really are, uh, a lot of those are focused on environmental justice communities. Um, so I think that there's, you know, there are some transformational policies that we have the opportunity to move forward right now. Um, and so there's only so much, there's only so much political will. There's only so many policies that we can get through. And so which ones we focus on is also, um, an important, an important thing to be considering as we talk about this, but to move us on, um, what gives you hope right now? Well, actually, I was going to say what gives me hope is exactly what you were just describing. You know, meaningful climate legislation is, well, it, you know, there's a really good chance that we could get it passed. And budget reconciliation is, is, um, is the time. I've been in discussions um, with, with um, all sorts of people, uh, groups. Um, and, you know, I think we need to embrace the concept of all the tools in the toolbox. And um, one, um, one um, uh, senior official um, in, I won't name the organization because we keep our, uh, our meetings confident, but one that advocates very strongly for frontline communities and specifically in terms of air pollution said that the really the worst thing that could happen right now would be for nothing to happen. And so it's really critical that we work together and um, I know what gives me hope, I, I think, is that things are likely to move. And why I think it's so important that a carbon price is included within that tool in the toolbox is a couple. You know, I embrace a clean electricity standard. I think it's great. I think it's great that, you know, we put a fee on emissions of methane, which is being discussed by Dems and Congress, and I support that 100%. Um, but there, it's pretty clear that it's uncertain whether a clean electricity standard will actually qualify during budget reconciliation and a price on carbon will definitely qualify because it's, it's you know, a tax. And so um, I think thinking about how we can do, how we can do it with frontline communities and, and play is important. And I definitely support the infrastructure um, uh, policies that, you know, are being put forward with frontline communities in place. I think they're critical to pass and I, I'm so excited about them. But I love also, again, the other thing about that White House Shot Save Our Future Act is what they have done is they've taken 70% um, of the funds and returned it only to low income families in the form of a direct dividend. And then they take the other 30% and it's um, earmarked directly from for communities that have suffered uh, directly from the burning of fossil fuels, so frontline communities, about $225 billion over 10 years. And then another about 125 billion goes to communities that have suffered from extraction like Native, community, Native American communities, but also coal communities that have to transition, uh, you know, the work and, you know, they've suffered tremendous health, um, burdens from, from you know, um, getting the coal out of the ground and certainly not self realized any of the profits of so those extraction communities. And then um, another 10 billion directly back uh, to states. So I think it really holds polluters accountable and it gives the money back directly to the communities that have suffered disproportionately. And it would incentivize, the point of it is to get off of fossil fuels. That's a whole idea of it, to transition away from them to a clean uh, economy. So that's what gives me hope. 
Is Michael working on only on carbon fee and dividend or are you working on other policies? Yeah, we embrace all of them. Okay. So, and actually you asked what Micah is doing. So let me go through uh, what Micah has been doing. And, um, you know, we have been working with a large number of state environmental groups to learn ways in which we can help. We're really in the beginning stages of this. We just formed a year ago. Uh, most uh, or other organizations are far ahead of us on this front. So we're really in a learning curve. And we're trying to learn a lot about state policies. In particular, uh, we've been working with coalitions that are advocating for electric vehicle infrastructure, which would improve outdoor air quality. But um, also uh, we've been working on um, with coalitions or trying to identify volunteers who will work with uh, the coalitions that are looking at energy efficiency and electrification of the building sector, which would not only decrease the amount of energy we need to use, but it would also improve indoor air quality, which is directly related to health as well. We've given testimony for the consumer's energy latest uh, IRP. Um, we've consulted with students and some faculty at Michigan Medicine and who have been developing medical school electives about the health impacts of climate change. And this fall, we plan to offer a development uh, faculty development lecture on the sub subject of how do we integrate climate into the medical curriculum. And we've talked with the Michigan Health Association, Green Team, and Spectrum Healthcare about the importance of decarbonizing healthcare and improving resilience. See, we certainly want our hospitals to be able to function um, during extreme weather events. And uh, we've participated in a webinar series put on by the Great Lakes um, Clinicians for Climate Advocacy. Uh, over the fall, there was a series of webinars and we've met with congressional offices to educate about the intersection of climate and health. And we hope uh, to be able at some point to meet with state congressional uh, offices in a similar capacity. So I'm really, really grateful for uh, so many of these organizations who have taken us under our, our wing, like uh, MICAN, like the Michigan Environmental Council. Um, a huge shout out to Kendra Weed, who is the director of My Air, My Health, who um, is a coalition of, um, I think mostly uh, nurses. We're all health practitioners. I think they're they have more health, but I may be wrong, more nurses, but I may be wrong on that. But their focus is specifically on air and they have just done such great work and they've helped us uh, learn from these other organizations who have really been very thoughtful about what can be done on a state and local level to address climate change and uh, that are so critical for health. So we're, we're just getting our feet wet. We have a lot to learn. Um, uh, in terms of environmental justice, um, we plan on also, um, we've been trying to meet with different environmental justice leaders throughout Michigan so we can learn more about what is important. And Wayne State University um, has a environmental health tour, which we're hoping to be able to take this fall so that we can uh, learn more and understand better how we can use our voices. And then the last thing we're trying to do is try to recruit more and more clinicians who are serving directly those communities so they can help inform us about the best ways, you know, to use our healthcare voice to advocate for frontline communities and to raise up those stories. And so for any health practitioners listening who are interested in getting involved with MICA, how can they find you? Okay, um, they can find us on Facebook and they can find it. We have a website that right now is being housed under the Medical Society Consortium, but we are building our own website at this point. And we're on social media also in terms of Instagram and Twitter. So they can find us at any of those uh, places and I can um, give you those links. I think that would be easier for me than to try to rattle them off like some people do after the fact and you can put them in the, in, in the in show notes. Our, yeah, in the show yeah. notes, thank you. Great, we will do that, thank you. Any last words, anything we didn't cover that you'd like to touch on? Um, well. Um, you asked me, uh, or in preparation, one of the questions was, um, you know, um, how can people make a difference? And um, what I would say, what I think is that this work is sacred work. 
And we are really, as you mentioned, at a critical moment in history in which we have a chance to pass really many, meaningful climate legislation. And I think it's so critical for those of us who care about this issue to work together and to learn from each other. The worst thing that could happen, as we, I said earlier, it would be for nothing to happen. So we need to be careful not to fight among ourselves, but instead listen really generously it's easy to dismiss another person's idea as wrong because it's different from our own, but uh, answers to problems are often very nuanced and I would urge people to embrace the concept of yes and. And most importantly, I would ask that each of us make it our daily practice to embrace hope over cynicism and trust that if we work together from a point of respect, it will result in a more equitable and diverse and rich tomorrow. So those are my thoughts. That's great. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us today on the podcast and for, for all of your work on climate change. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for your work with my can and bringing us all together so that we can have these important conversations. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Speaking of Resilience podcast. You can find more episodes of the Speaking of Resilience podcast at our website, groundworkcenter.org slash podcast, miclimateaction.org slash podcast, or on all major podcast platforms. If you appreciate this content and want more of it, stay up to date by subscribing to the podcast wherever you listen in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps other listeners find the Speaking of Resilient podcast. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Groundwork Center and at MI Climate Action. Speaking of Resilience is created by the Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities and the Michigan Climate Action Network. This episode was produced by Taylor Kramer of Cold Shower Media in collaboration with Nick Loud of the Boardman Review.